Thank you very much. So um, the genesis of this project that I'm doing uh, began with two different domestic, or let's say household conversations. Uh, one of them is entirely imaginary, and the other one is true. Um, first for the imaginary one, I imagine that this is a conversation that took place in the Stromsa household um, sometime in the early, early years of the, of the 21st century. Um, this is when Saro was finishing or writing her book on Maimonides, and uh, he was writing his book uh, entitled A New Science. Um, and I was reading these uh, books uh, uh, side by side, and a few thoughts came to mind. So, so one evening um, in Jerusalem, <laughs> As, uh, as, as Guy and Sara were contemplating whether to open a bottle of red or a bottle of white, <laughs> um, one, one of them asked the other. Um, I think Sara must have said to Guy, you know, Guy, I'm writing a book about Maimonides, and I'm thinking about calling him a phenomenologist of religion in one of my chapters. Right? Um, and Guy said, of course, well, you know, phenomenologist of religion, that's a very powerful phrase. Uh, what exactly do you mean by that? And Sara would have responded, um, you know, I mean that when he wrote about the Sabians, he thought of them not so much as a historically identifiable people, but rather as a uh, rather amorphous group that are defined more by uh, a certain set of beliefs um, and corresponding practices rather than, um, you know, generation after generation. And Guy says, well, yeah, that, that makes sense. That's pretty much the idea of what a, a phenomenologist of religion uh, might be, but nonetheless, of course, it's a very modern term, and it's uh, you know it's anachronistic, you know, and so that's why it has a, its power in, in in the title chapter. So then the conversation turns a bit, and Guy says, you know, I'm working on a book. I'm thinking about calling it a new science, um, and it's about a major paradigm shift in the study of religion in the West, where there seems to be a new type of taxonomy of world religions that emerges. Um, and that this is traceable specifically to the 17th, uh, you know, to the 16th and 17th century, following the discovery of the New World, and the European conquest of the Americas, their encounter with the uh, natives of of the Americas, um, and that caused them to rethink, and uh, even in many ways, for the, the very, very category of religion itself to emerge. Right? Um, and then Sara responds, "You know, Goitein once wrote an article um, in which he talked about the medieval Islamic world." in which he said it was the medieval Islamic world that introduced a quote-unquote new science, <laughs> using that exact phrase. Um, uh, and what Goitain was referring to there was this genre of literature um, that we refer to generally as the uh, uh, literature of uh, Amila Wal Nihal, right? The book, the uh, literature of uh, religious communities and usually sex, translated there as. Um, so that's one point of departure. The other point of departure, and that... Why did they choose? Oh, yes, that ended with uh, white, I believe. Red? I don't know. Um, the other point of departure was actually a real conversation um, that I had with, with my own wife, um, actually then my fiance, and maybe a little bit less of a discussion than an argument. And this goes back to the year 2000, um, in which we were planning our wedding. We were getting married uh, in September of, of 2000. And uh, it was about a month before the wedding, and we started talking about what it is we were going to say to each other under the chuppah, because we wanted a very egalitarian structure to the, to the wedding. And so I was going to use the traditional Jewish formula, you know, harayat, mekudesh, alib, tabat, and so forth, kedat Moshe v'Yisrael. And then she wanted also to say, behold, you, you, are, behold, you are sanctified unto me, kedat Moshe v'Yisrael. And at the time, uh, you know, according to the dot, roughly, what I thought was either religion or law of Moses and Israel. Um, and uh, at the time I objected, I don't really know why, but um, to me it didn't make a tremendous amount of sense because there wasn't a way in which a man became betrothed to a woman according to the dot of Moshe in Yisrael. And it just didn't seem to mean something definitively. Um, of course I was wrong, um, not only in the sense that uh, uh, it's always a stupid idea to disagree with the bride uh, about the <laughs> wedding ceremony. But no, on the much deeper level, that had I been a, a Talmud Chacham, I would have realized that I didn't really know what the word dat meant in that sentence. Kedat Moshe Yisrael, I thought it meant according to the religion of Moses and Israel. Uh, years later, um, uh, you know, I, I discovered that uh, what dat Moshe generally means in rabbinic literature has to do a, with a specific set of obligations within Judaism. In other words, not the name of religion 
dot Moshe as opposed, to, let's say, to the dot of Jesus or the dot of Muhammad, but rather it refers to particular practices within Jewish, within Judaism, certain obligations, that and especially tithing. So I didn't know what I was getting into, I guess. Um, and of course, the Talmud also has a parallel category, which is dat Yehudit, um, which refers to the laws of modesty generally, but again, to obligations that occur within Judaism. Um, some of you probably have a sense of where I'm going with this, um, which is that it, you know, it's generally uh, argued that the very concept of religion comes about, as Guy has written about, and also as uh, Jonathan Z. Smith has written about, um, with the discovery of the New World. And that prior to um, the 16th century, the word religio in uh, Latin was used only in the singular um, and referred to a set of obligations within Christianity rather than to the names of different religions. And that the plural of the word uh, religions really came about only with the discovery of the New World. And that then leaves us with an interesting set of questions about what exactly it is that's distinguishing the medieval period from the early modern period, and also the broad question of whether this uh, argument holds across languages and across cultures. Um, so much like the word dat in Hebrew, the word din in Arabic um, is, a, is a pretty tough word. Um, and I'd say that the, the exact contours of that word and the exact history of that word have not really uh, been charted sufficiently. Um, we know that in the Quran, uh, you know, deen is the word that we use for religion in the modern sense. So you, you know, just like you'd say in Hebrew, I study limu de datot, you know, you'd say I study adyan, right, multiple religions. But that's probably a really late introduction. Um, in the Quran, uh, the word deen has a very limited set of meanings. Um, it seems to mean judgment, like it does in Hebrew. Um, and um, it also seems to have to do with like a mode of worship, right? So famously, uh, Muhammad uh, says to the uh, to the unbelievers, you know, lakum dinukum waliyadin, right? You have your deen, and I have mine. But it's really, you know, you worship what you worship, and I worship what I worship. And the question there is whether the deen, the word deen, there should be translated with that capital R religion as it's usually thought of in the West, or whether it means something that's a little bit more limited. And most scholars. Um, have come down on it meaning something much, much more limited. Um, subsequent uh, to the Quran, you know, we don't have a single work that really gives us the full semantic range of uh, the word deen over time. Uh, Ahmed Karim Mustafa wrote an article just uh, in 2017 um, that did this with a small uh, number of texts, largely philosophical texts. And in that, he has a, 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 a sentence that simply says, um, uh, there's this vast literature of amila wal nihal, um, of religious community and sex, and we should do this type of semantic study over time and see how it is that that word evolves and how it is, uh, and what exactly it seems to connote. Um, you know, of course, now we also have the massive survey of this genre of literature that was uh, undertaken by Yosef von S. Um, you know, and this is a work that I'm gradually uh, working through because of its, uh, its, its size. But, um, you know, this is where I'm heading. So basically, um, I'm not making much of an argument today. What I'm rather doing is I'm charting out a project. Um, this is what I see myself doing over the next uh, however long it takes, but I'd say it'll take at least a decade. Um, and the general idea of the project is I want to try to understand the ways in which uh, a term such as religion do, uh, does or does not map onto medieval ideas of deen, um, and also the kind of afterlife of this thinking in Jewish thought, the imprints that are made within uh, Jewish writings um, that seem to be adopting a lot of the same sort of logic and the same sort of, um, let's say, modes of thought that you find in uh, this Milo Wanichal literature. And of course, you know, Sarah's chapter on Maimonides is uh, I'd say really what, what drew me to this, um, to this field, um, to this area of inquiry, it exposed me to a number of texts that I wasn't really familiar with. Um, you know, it was the most serious treatment of Maimonides and how he would have read a work such as the Nabataean Agriculture and what, what use he made of it. Um, but I, I'm trying to propose a project that will look at Jewish thought sort of writ large uh, throughout the medieval period with these types of questions in mind. You know, can we talk about other thinkers as phenomenologists of religion and so on and so forth. Um, 
so, um, so all I want to do today is actually just look at a few texts with you, uh, more in seminar style than in terms of making a particular argument, and, um, and just show you some ways in which the word dean and related vocabulary are functioning within particular passages. Um, and what seems to be the malleability of the term, um, and also the question of what it may, uh, what it may not mean. Um, so, so, um, but just broadly speaking, the, the questions that I'm interested in, I'd say, are um, the meaning of dean, the taxonomy of different religions or of, of different groups. Um, what the relationship is, if any, between monotheistic groups and non-monotheistic groups, the types of logic that are guiding different works within uh, this field. So um, I have Arabic text for whoever wants. Sorry, I gave you not so much a handout as a choveret, um, which is uh, you know, just for your take-home reading enjoyment. These are not uh, unknown texts. These are, these are known texts. Um, but I, 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 I don't know that uh, they've been in mind for everything that, that they can be. Um, these are very much translations in project, progress, by the way. Um, I, I made a number of corrections on the plane that I'll hopefully uh, be able to make as we go along. Um, so uh, the first text that I want to address is, um, let's see, so I'm having trouble scrolling. There we go. Okay. Um, so this is um, a work that doesn't specifically title itself as belonging to the Mila wa Nihal genre. Um, instead, it's entitled Al Athar Al Baqiya, um, which means basically the, 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 the remaining vest, I mean, the remaining monuments or uh, like the remaining traces. Athar, if there's an Athar, can mean sign, it can mean monument, um, and so forth. Um, and it was written by uh, Al Biruni. Um, Al Biruni is a very well known uh, astronomer. Um, he wrote this book, and he's also very well known for another book, um, which I'll, I'll show you a piece of also where he wrote about India. He's very well known for having studied Sanskrit in great detail and going, going to India, spending many years there, and studying um, everything he, he could about this, about Indian society. He was kind of a very deep anthropologist in a lot of ways. Um, so, this is his introduction to this work. Um, in which he's going to go through the different calendrical systems and ways of measuring epochs in time of different communities of the world, which he calls umam, right? So nation, the different nations of the world. So the religions of the world is not exactly the organizational principle of the book. It's about different nations, their calendrical systems, which then leads to their practices related to particular uh, calendrical moments, which um, leads ultimately also to beliefs, in other words, but, the, but that's the order of generation, that it goes from calendar to practices to associated uh, beliefs and not the other way. Um, so uh, just to read to you a little bit. Um, uh, so it says, one of the men of letters, the Udaba, asked me about the periods or the epochs that nations use and the differences that occur in the roots, which are their fundamental concepts, and in the branches which are their months and years, and also about the reasons that urge their people toward them, and also about the well-known festivals and the commemorated days concerning times and practices, amal, roughly, and also about other things that some nations practice while others do not. He recommended explication of this in the clearest way possible with the purpose of making the reader understand and obviating the burden of gathering scattered books and the questions or arguments uh, people have raised concerning them. Um, I begin by stating that the most proximate means for achieving what was asked of me will be through knowledge of the reports of former nations. So notice there's a method being laid out here. In other words, rather than simply studying what people are doing at this particular moment only, I'm also going to study uh, works about their history, uh, what they've written about themselves, um, and information concerning past generations. For most of the current circumstances are passed down from them and, uh, and their um, uh, you know, vestigial institutes, or their, their, their surviving or their remaining uh, institutes. 
Um, they derive from past in institutes and laws or customs. There's no way to attain the goal other than this, whether from seeking demonstration through things known by reason or by analogy with what is observed by the senses, whether they are the tradition, the taklid, and that's a word that has like a slightly uh, negative tinge to it. It's as opposed to something that's surely been handed down with certainty. A taklid um, is, is, is more subject to question. Uh, whether they are the tradition of the people of the book and religious communities, ahl al-kutub wal-milal, or the possessors of opinions and sects, ashab al ara wal nihal, um, who make use of these institutes and laws. I will make their, and so it's not a book about these religious communities in its title, but in terms of uh, the way he describes the subject matter, you can see that these phrases, milal, nihal, uh, ahl al kitab, ahl al ara, they're, they're all featuring prominently. And in subsequent, um, uh, or, or in other works, let's say, um, they come to be the headline. In other words, they become the organizational principle of the books. Here, it's really the calendars that start the subject and that leads to the study of these religions. Um, and, but in other works, it'll, it'll go the other way. Um, so, uh, so he says, I'll make their positions a foundation to be built upon afterwards. Then I will compare their claims and their views in establishing one against the other. All of this will be after freeing the soul from the harmful hindrances that affect most people and the causes that blind a person from the truth. These are ingrained custom, factionalism, and alliance formation, following desire, seeking dominance, and similar things. I just included a random footnote to a very similar sounding phrase from Maimonides. I'm not suggesting any direct borrowing. Uh, it just, uh, I heard it in my ears, and I, and I, so I, I thought of the associate, and I, I wrote it down. Um, so, um, so then the book is organized to each of these different nations. There's, of course, a chapter on the Greeks and a chapter on the Persians. There's a chapter on the Jews. Um, the chapter on the Jews, for example, he goes through all the different fast days that the Jews practice, many of which I had never heard of. My favorite one being the fast of Jeroboam, um, commemorating the, uh, the day that, the, that uh, King Jeroboam erected two golden calves for the worship of of, of Israel, and he actually concentrates on this story for a pretty long time, um, which is a, something I, I may be able to come back to later in the talk. Um, then he has a chapter on um, the, the Tawarikh of al Mutanabiin, right? So the, the, the periods of the people who act like prophets, right? So not real prophets necessarily, but people uh, who pretend to be prophets. Um, and I just want to have you look at kind of briefly. I mean, I don't even want to read it truthfully. Um, um, but I'm just hoping that you can glance at it. Because what, what I'm trying to point out here is the list of subjects that the author deems worthy of reporting. So I'm not, it's in the interest of time, I won't actually read it, or at least not all of it, but I'll point out a few things. So, um, so he's going to talk about the Mutanabi, the pseudo prophet, or the person who acted like a prophet, Buddha Saf, uh, who appeared one year uh, after the enthronement of Tahmurat in the land of India. And this is, of course, a legend that would have reached um, the Arab world through various stories, eventually got uh, treated in Hebrew also. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't want to focus so much on whether any of this is factual or a good description. He's going to talk about the Sabians, of course, and Sarah has written you know, quite extensively um, about this. Um, but just notice there, in the second sentence, he says, he introduced Persian writing and called people to the religious community of the Sabians, uh, Milat Asabi'in. So the, the Mila is kind of a social body, um, as opposed to, let's say, a doctrine. Um, uh, and in the second paragraph, um, he says, the remainder of the Sabians... The remainder of the Sabians are in Haran, their names associated with their locale. They're called Haranians. It's also said that it's associated with Haran ben Terach, or Ibn Terach, the brother of Abraham, may peace be upon him, and that he was one of their leaders who caused them to penetrate deeply in the deen. Uh, I translated there as religion, but if I were going to rewrite this, I think I'd actually just leave the word deen as deen in every instance. Um, but penetrate deeply in the religion 
and cause them to grasp it firmly. Okay, so first, you know, we notice that a form of idolatry can be a deen. So a deen isn't a term that's reserved only for uh, Judaism, Christianity, uh, and Islam, and so forth. And later he'll call other things nihal, uh, sex, but it's not entirely clear how he's using that word either. Sometimes he seems to use it as a subset of a larger religious group, and sometimes he uses it just to, it, it, as another group. Um, but uh, he never uses it to name the, the umbrella group of a monotheistic tradition. He uses it to refer to uh, the Hindus broadly um, and to subsets of Christians. But um, So if you just kind of glance through uh, the subjects here, sorry, I can only do this like this, you'll see the things that interest him are their beliefs, right? So it starts off with the unity in God, apophatic pronunciations, not cataphatic. Um, here he starts among their monuments. So he goes immediately from a few core beliefs to architecture. Um, is the dome that is above the mihrab within the ruler's maksura, the enclosure of the mosque of Damascus. It was their place of worship in the days of the Greeks and Romans, according to their deen, ala dinim. And I translate there as their practice, but I'm trying to show a certain amount of fluidity. And I just practice there because it's specifically talking about the way in which they worshipped. Then, then it became a synagogue, and then it becomes a, a church, and then it becomes a mosque. Um, they had temples and idols known by various names. You can read about this in another book called... Uh, the houses of worship. Um, um, so he goes on for a while about their uh, practices. Um, then a bit about their eating habits. Um, and what's interesting here is um, that he talks about those who forbade fish, fearing it might be a torpedo fish, a certain type of fish, and also poultry because it's always feverish. Um, which doesn't have its origin in a religious uh, ordinance. In other words, there's no commandment not to eat these things. It's, it's just they seem to avoid these things. He doesn't say it's of any particular um, uh, devotional value, but it's still within the categories that he uh, wants to include. So when he goes through each of these different groups, he's interested in certain types of subjects and a certain range of subjects, um, which you know, we see here. I, I only chose this because it's a relatively full example. So he has foods, then they have prayers. They have three written prayers, the first is sunrise. They have different cycles of prayer. They have purification and ablution. They wash after impurity. Um, most of their regulations, ahkam, concerning women and punishment are like the regulations of the Muslims. With regard to contracting impurity following the touching of a corpse and similar things, their regulations resemble the Torah. They make oblations in connection with the stars and their idols and temples and sacrifices that their priests and their chanters perform, uh, and so on. The last paragraph, Hermes is called Idris, who is mentioned in the Torah as Hanoch. Some of them claim that Buddhasaf is Hermes. Um, uh, other theories about the Sabians. Um, and then just the last sentence, which I found very interesting, where he says, they incline, Sabao, Right, as though the word Sabian came from a root meaning to incline or to lean, um, they leaned, uh, they inclined toward the Jews of, uh, toward the laws of the, of, of the Magians and inclined toward the practice or the dean of Nebuchadnezzar and followed a school that was a mixture of Magianism and Judaism. And notice these words al, -Nas al Majusiyah and Al Yahudiyah in those forms. You know, in Jewish studies, people. Uh, often make the point that um, the word Yahadut doesn't seem to come about until fairly late in the Middle Ages um, as the name of religion, right? You speak about Jews as an ethnos and then the things that Jews believe and do, but you don't actually talk about Judaism in that sense. But I, I think that these words, uh, Majusia and Yahudia, um, do map on pretty well to our concept of their being, uh, being religions. Um, also, so a couple of things are really fascinating here, right? One is that um, he draws comparisons between idolatrous groups 
and monotheistic groups, right? So as much as, and you'll see this in a moment, he does draw a big line in the sand between uh, idolatry and monotheism. Well, we'll see it in a minute. Um, he does think that there are points that are very much comparable, right? You can compare what people believe on X or Y, and you can compare what they do ab about X or Y. You can compare the types of, uh, of regulations that they have. That's one thing. The other thing that's very fascinating here is the idea of the mixture of religions, right? Um, elsewhere, he writes about the Samaritans in exactly the same way and says that you know, they are a mixture of X and Y. And so here you see a type of process that's being referred to. With, with all these texts, I'm interested in the underlying assumptions and underlying processes of the way that religions can emerge. Like much like Zara wrote about um, you know, the idea of devolution of a religion over time. Does a religion evolve? Does it devolve? Well, it certainly changes. This idea of a religion inclining and of mixing in different ways is also uh, very much a part of this, the same idea. Um, his other main work is this book about India. Um, I'm not going to get... What time do you want me to finish? Like, what time do you want me to finish speaking? I mean, questions and answers done at 5.15, or you want me to... I'll try to finish. It's possible. You know, I'll take a break at a certain point, and we'll see where things go. Okay. Um, his other main work is this work on India. Um, uh, he, here he's, you know, so he says, I state that the Greeks in the days of ignorance... Um, oh, I'm sorry. I skipped one thing I want to point out. Uh, something I don't know the answer to. Um, Okay. No, it's further up than that. Ah. Um, so at the beginning of the work, he talks about why India is a difficult subject to study. So one of the reasons it's difficult is because the language is difficult. You have to learn Sanskrit. And then he says, among the reasons for which India is difficult to penetrate is that they differ from us in Aldiana completely. Nothing of what we affirm holds in their view. And nothing that they affirm holds in our view. There's little, and the rest of it's not uh, that important. So, um, you know, here's a statement that focuses on doctrine, right? They don't hold what we hold, and we, I think, I think that's what he's saying. Um, and uh, nothing that they hold is the same as what we hold. Um, the word diana and its distinction from dean, I'm not 100% sure about. I don't know when the word diana uh, enters the language, exactly what the uh, author's trying to connote by using this word um, instead of dean. Um, but it seems to be a more abstract uh, uh, kind of idea. But I'd be curious to hear if, if people knew about uh, the answer to that or what their thoughts are. Um, there's a couple of other quotes. There's one that you will like. Um, he's talking about the Greeks. He says, I state that the Greeks in the days of ignorance prior to the appearance of Christianity held a similar doctrine to that of the Hindus. I think the word there was akhida, if I remember correctly. Um, their elite similar to their elite concerning speculation and their masses similar to their masses concerning the worship of idols. You know, so one of the main theses that he's known for in his book about India is that understood correctly, Hinduism is essentially a form of monotheism. And that although they seem to be worshipping idols, it should not be taken um, except in the way that the, the vulgar masses understand their own religion as a form of idolatry. The elites, the Brahmins, whom he writes about at length, um, know that there's a single cause to the universe, much like the Greeks. And so he draws you know, numerous connections between the Greeks um, and the Indians, and in that uh, the most educated among them were ultimately monotheists, right? And that they used um, uh, objects of worship in particular ways, not necessarily as idols to be worshipped themselves, um, but more often as a mediator um, between themselves and the, the first cause. And uh, we'll, we'll see that in a bit. Um, so he says, uh, I cite the words of one against the other because of the agreement and similarity of the two, of the two matters, and not in order to correct them. All save the truth is falsehood. Falsehood, unbelief is a single community. It's a beautiful sentence. A kufr milla wahida. And there he uses the word milla, which again was like a religious community. Right? So that's the idea of a, a phenomenology uh, once again. Um, 
So all unbelief is a single community because of its diversion from it. Um, there's lots of other good quotes here, and just pointing out again that these words um, are used, Nasraniya for Christianity, Yahudiya for Judaism. Um, uh, in this passage, he says, the Hindus view the law and its customs as issuing from the rishis, the sages, who are the foundations of the deen, or the foundations are like the pillars of the uh, religion or the practice, and not from the prophet, Rasul, and that's a very uh, striking word, right? It's not Nabi, but rather it's Rasul, um, which is, you know, a messenger, which is usually used only for the big three. Um, and he says that their messenger is called Narayana, who takes the form of a man when he appears. He will never appear except to bring an end to some wicked matter that has arisen in the world or to put right something that has transpired. There's no substituting anything from the matter of customs, they perform them as they find them. Because of this, there's no need for messengers among them with respect to the canonical law and worship, though they do have a need for prophets regarding earthly matters. You know, so as much as he's using a very particular uh, Islamic term, Rasul, which is usually reserved just for a messenger, a lawgiver, um, he's using it in a very uh, kind of neutered sense. He's saying, you know, the Narayana will, he's like a superman. You know, he'll intervene in the world in order to fix something that's on the verge of catastrophe, but he's not a, uh, a bringer of laws. They don't need a bringer of laws uh, in that sense. Um, so throughout the work, he's, he, thinks, he, he, organi he thinks about Indian uh, beliefs and practices according to Islamic categories. So he has a section on their fast days, and a section on their prayers, and a section on um, their, uh, their, their rituals of purity, their laws of incest, and so on and so forth. Um, but always according to Islamic categories. Um, here's a really great passage, but I'm going to skip it, just in the interest of time. Okay, I just want to call attention to a couple of other major works uh, by Muslim figures. Um, Ibn Hazm uh, wrote this book, uh, The Book of Division Concerning Religious Communities, Wal Ahwa, which is a great word. It's um, it's uh, views that people seem to adopt according to their whims. So it comes from a root meaning desire, so it's something that they whimsically uh, uh, adopt. Um, uh, which we've seen before. Um, this is uh, a work that, of course, would have been known uh, in 11th century Spain. Um, Hartwig Hirschfeld, by the way, um, in his uh, uh, writing on the Kuzari, he speculated that this book may have been known to Halevi. Uh, as far as I know, no one has really explored this possibility, um, at least systematically. Um, we know, of course, that Halevi read the Nabataean agriculture as Maimonides did. Um, uh, he mentions some of the specific figures that, that occur in the, in the book. But, you know, if, if he didn't read this actual book, I think you see very clear indications in Halevi's writing, his use of vocabulary, some of the thought patterns, some of the arguments, they really seem to grow out of this mode of thinking about religious, uh, uh, religious communities. Um, so that's ultimately something that I, I hope to do. Um, you know, that said, I haven't found anything that is a clear quotation from uh, this book. I haven't found anything uh, that, there's no, there's no, no smoking gun there. Um, but, uh, you know, as Sarah uh, wrote uh, about Maimonides, you know, people don't, often don't cite things um, that, that they read, and it's quite possible that, that he read this or was familiar with its thought. Um, the organizational principle of this book is very different from what we saw with Al-Biruni. It's organized according to doctrine. Um, that is the starting point, and he's mostly interested, um, it, it's funny because it's not exactly a book of polemics, but ultimately it is. It's a very descriptive work, but it's, but it's organized according to um, groups that can be argued against in similar ways. <laughs> right? So rather than, let's say, having a chapter on Judaism and a chapter on Christianity, he has a chapter on Jews and uh, non-Trinitarian Christians. Why? Because they, can be they have to be argued against with a similar set of arguments. Um, whereas the, uh, the, Magi the, the Magians are, are treated uh, together with, uh, with Trinitarian Christians. Okay? So when we're thinking about the taxonomy of a work like this, it's not simply monotheistic religions, then pagan religions, but rather it's something a little, a little more nuanced than that. 
Um, so just to sh uh, give you his six groups, he says, uh, the groups that differ from the deen of Islam are six. Each of these groups breaks down into further groups. I will mention all of them, God willing, lofty, and exalted. The six groups I will mention according to their graduated steps, and I think that's an important word, maratib, of distance from us are, one, those who nullify all truths, and they are called the uh, sophistic mutakalimun. I'm not sure if that's great. Uh, those who hold that there are truths but maintain that the world is eternal and that it has no creator or governor. Those who hold that there are truths and that the world is eternal, although it has an eternal governor. Those who hold that there are truths, some of them believe that the world is eternal, while others believe that it is created. They all hold that there are eternal governors who are more than one, but they differ as to their number. And that's where the non I mean, that's where the Trinitarian Christians and uh, these other uh, polytheistic groups fall in together. Um, and it is those who hold that there are truths, um, that there is one eternal creator. Right? So now we have um, non-Trinitarian Christians and Jews. Uh, but nullify, pro I'm sorry, this isn't them. They, they come up later. But nullify prophecy altogether, right? So those are going to be your Greek philosophers who recognize that there is a single cause to the universe, um, but that there's not a prophecy as, as Ibn Hazm thinks about it. Um, and those who hold that there are truths, that the world is created, but there's one eternal creator, but established prophecy, uh, though they, or and established prophecy, I should say, though they disagree about some of them, they accept some of the prophets, but reject others, right? So he has this very, uh, very particular um, taxonomy of the groups he's going to talk about. And again, I think it's being driven by the types of arguments that have to be mounted against these, uh, these groups together. And it's not quite as straightforward as um, monotheists, polytheists, and so forth. Um, so let's see, is this worth reading? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is his long passage on a, f a few different groups. You've got uh, the, Magian, the, Ma the Magians, um, they have laws, um, and there are these other groups. Um, I mean, no, we, 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 we can skip this. I guess. Well, down here is where he talks about um, uh, the Christians. So. This part's worth reading. So, that which the Sabians embrace, yantahilu, and you know, that's the root of the word nihla, which is translated often as sect, but the root of the word really simply means to embrace, um, which uh, you know, it's hard sometimes to say what makes that different from a deen. So, that which the Sabians embrace was the oldest of adyan, it was the oldest deen on the face of the earth. Um, and the most widespread in the world to such a point that they invented new things and substituted its laws. Therefore God sent them his friend Abraham, may God pray for him and grant him peace with the deen of Islam, which we follow now. And he has some stories about, uh, about Muhammad. and um, He says, the Christians are a part of this group in one sense, but are outside of it in another. As for the sense in which they are part of this group, is their claim of the Trinity, and that the creator of the creation is three. As for the sense in which they are outside of it, is that the Sabians have laws that they attribute to Hermes. They say that he is Idris. They mention that other people are prophets, um, and, and so on. Um, yeah. um, why, don't, why, don't I, why don't I pause now for a bit, and then maybe... Um, you know, we'll go on to uh, some of the Jewish texts. I mean, I did, so the next section of the talk would be about, um, you know, what's widely recognized as the great phenomenologically oriented book of the genre, which would be a Shahrastani's uh, compilation on the Nihal, uh, uh, Mila Will Nihal. And um, again, his organization in this book is not going to be um, uh, according simply to monotheism versus polytheism, but rather it's organized as such things as a group that has a, a revealed book, right? And then after that, a book that has something resembling a, real, uh, a revealed book, but isn't the Torah or the Injil or the, or the Quran. Um, then he has groups that have laws and statutes uh, that derive uh, from prophets. And then he has groups that have laws 
and statutes, but don't believe in prophets. Again, you know, the organization is not simply the names of different religions, but it's actually these broader categories that different religions can fit into in, in various ways. Um, so, you know, this is all a very roundabout way <laughs> of saying that there's a very sophisticated, complicated discourse about this category of deen in medieval Arabic writing. This is going to have a tremendous impact on the ways that Jews think about other groups um, and ultimately, uh, I would argue, Judaism itself. Um, my ultimate uh, uh, thesis that I guess I'm experimenting with and hope to resolve within a decade or so um, is um, that, uh, you know, prior to the medieval period and the Jewish encounter with Islam, um, uh, Judaism was defined largely as an ethnos, um, that they didn't think so much in terms of um, uh, a system of beliefs and practices as in a particular people. The encounter with the Islamic world, um, and particularly Arabic writing about the subject of deen, uh, caused them to see, uh, cause, allowed for Judaism to emerge as one uh, species of a broader genus, right? One example of a broader category that we might call uh, Adyan. And in, this, in a sense, Judaism becomes a religion uh, through this process. And you see this in their Judeo-Arabic writing and then uh, later in their Hebrew writing. Um, so that's, that's, that's where I'm heading in a nutshell. I'm sure that you'll have plenty of uh, thoughts and criticisms. Um, so we can draw these things out. But I just want to expose you to some of the type of literature um, that I'm looking at, and again, the different organizational principles, the taxonomies of different groups uh, that are there, and just uh, some of the terminology that's operative and seems to be very much in flux, uh, in my view. Um, so why don't, we, why don't we talk for a while, and then I can turn to some specific uh, Jewish examples or what have you. Uh, should I do this myself, or uh, Sarah? Which, you mean the word taqlid, or you mean... Yeah, with the, when oh. with the word taqlid. What he's okay. saying there is the siwa goes in, in, in another part of the sentence. So I think we can go... Oh, I mean, let, let's go over it. But. But, but what he's actually saying is that the only way that mm. the historian of religion, if you want, mm. can, follow, can get to the bottom of what the religions is, uh, the religions are, is not by istidlal and following uh, relig uh, uh, the intellect mm -hmm. and yes. but only by taklid. Right. That's the only way you can get no, to no, I, I, I'm sorry, I think that's what it, that's, that is my understanding, Sarah. Well, um, it's not what the so. Uh, so, you know, I think it's just a following of akhbar. In other words, he's using taklid and akhbar in similar ways. Um, you know, in the first sentence in the paragraph, he says, the best way of achieving this is through knowledge of the reports of former nations and so forth. And then later in the taqlid, I think he's, I think he's using taqlid instead of naql, intentionally, or tawatur, to, to say, you know, we don't have to take this as absolute fact, but nonetheless, this is the best that we can do. This is what we should rely on rather than uh, rationality, rather than analogies based on the physical world. It does not read. Does not read that. As this procession as was here was the opposite, and I think that yeah. what he is actually doing here is the same as he does also in the book on, on India, where he. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, no, the right. The word weather should just say, but rather by. Yeah. Yeah, but rather by. You know, that, that's fine. Yeah. It has I'm, the yeah. same methodology in, in the book of India where yeah. he praises Iran Shahri because he says Iran Shahri didn't have any religion which he had heard. Right. He could just observe the religions, and therefore he was, he was a good historian of Indian religion. Mm -hmm. So that's just one thing. And okay. The other comment is about Ibn Hazm yeah. and his uh, division of the six different kinds of religious groups. And I think that what he has there is on one side you have the sophists who don't believe in any reality, yeah. who don't believe in haqqaiq, mm -hmm. who treat the haqqaiq as, as illusions. And then all the others believe in reality. So I, rather than around truth, truth. I would say the reality, because right. the, the issue here is whether you accept right. uh, the uh, information yeah, given by the sense. Right. There's, there's something that can be resolved. Yeah, yeah, no, that, yeah I, should, I should fix that. That's good. I, I agree. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, it's really a very fascinating project. One thing that I, perhaps one, one should think more about and look more at it, we all, I mean, I always use these uh, historiographies of the Muslim writers as a source for information here and there. I've n never really found studies on classific comparative classifications with the historiographies in patristic literature okay. and, of course, the geographical literature in, in late antiquity. Yeah. That's definitely something that needs to be done. And in that respect, for all of them, and that's actually my slightly critical remark, if I have understood you correctly, I would be very hesitant to read there anything of a, a genetic theory of the becoming of religions, for example, connected to the, to the idea of mixture. I would, I would say that a priori, the more likely system is always that they are trying to classify as many possible varieties of sects as possible as they are, mm. and that, uh, that also the, the concept of mixture actually means they are combining uh, different elements of ideal types which they are yeah. constructing and that it has nothing to do with the fact that somebody took something from there and added something else unless yeah. we have a different uh, really opposite evidence yeah. and in that respect I also would be very careful about uh, any kind of reification of abstract nouns like Yahudia, Nasrania yeah. and so on. I think these are <coughs> abstract nouns which, which from a rhetorical or way of, of presenting the things it had to be invented in order to find abstract names in order to designate certain assemblages of certain doctrines. Yeah. But I think that within the, that, that would be at least my uh, more or less learned guess, that within this uh, heresiographical literature, these terms actually do not designate any real entities or, or religions in the sense which you're what we're looking for, mm -hmm. but rather ideal combinations of different doctrines. Yeah. So, I mean, so, so that all the comments that are being made are things that I agree with, suggest I didn't present as clearly as I wish. No. So, you know, so, I mean, one on the, on looking at the heresiographic, and which is from, from late antiquity, you know, that's very much, um, uh, what, in a way, what's generating the project. In other words, a lot of, um, what, what, what fascinates me is, for late antiquity, this is a subject of discussion um, that many different voices have weighed in on um, whether or not religion existed as a category in late antiquity. And that for the medieval period, we've really done very, very little with this type of question, um, and that we can, right? So the, the extreme position um, would be uh, something like what Daniel Boyarn argues uh, in, in a recent book that he co authored um, that's titled, like, uh, Imagine No Religion. And the idea of the book is that when you see translations of Latin texts or Greek texts, you have to, and you encounter a word such as religio or thereica, um, I think is the right pronunciation, um, and somebody translates that as religion, you should go back and cross that word out um, and then leave it in its original language. In other words, um, to, um, because a word in a pre-modern context isn't going to carry the same semantic range as our word religion, right? And so what he does with the word religio is he thinks it has to do with um, a group that advocates for a particular people, right? 
Um, so around the word Ayudeos, he would say, um, uh, these are the people who fight in favor of Judah, meaning the territory, um, but should not be mistaken for the name of a religion. On the other end of the argument, um, there's a guy named uh, Jeremy Schott um, who argues that, you know, if you look at pre-modern, uh, if you look at classical uh, heresiographic literature, there does seem to be something that looks a lot like the modern discourse on religion. And in fact, it should be seen as a starting point of it. Um, and that it is fair to talk about them having something like what we mean when we talk about religion. And so the, the semantics of that argument kind of uh, fascinate me. Um, because in a sense, they're both right and they're both wrong. Um, words come into being in order, I believe, to fill existing gaps. Right? So the, the, the coinage of Nasraniya or Yahudiya, I think that they're there, and I, I, I take the word of caution about overgeneralizing um, um, their generic sense uh, to be uh, something as broad as a religion, um, but they are trying to express something that hadn't previously been expressed. And the question is, what exactly what? Is that is sympathetic or? <laughs> so I mean, I, I mean, as I say, I mean, at the beginning of a project, and all I'm trying to do at this point is get the questions right, <laughs> you know. Um, so and and read with a certain set of lenses as I progress through a series of texts. Uh, Sabine. So, um, you know, so obviously this is a, 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 this genre is a place to start, right? Um, 
you know, when I was reading Halevi, you know, I realized how much of the, the, this vocabulary is central to his, uh, his discussions. Like when he talks about the golden calf, you know, he says that the people adopted uh, Ara, uh, you know, by which I think he means doctrines that they arrived at uh, on their own. He uses the word firaq so frequently. In other words, it seemed to point to, uh, to this genre to start with. Um, but certainly there are many places to look. And so like if our, you know, over the next 10 years, um, you know, uh, for Tafsir, I would start probably with the conversion of the Queen of Sheba, right? Because she's explicitly just transformed from being a worshiper of, uh, of stars, I guess, um, and, into being a monotheist. And so I'm sure the way that that story gets told um, will, will give traces to some of this. And of course, also, you know, in, in Jewish literature, I'm looking at uh, uh, commentaries on the Book of Kings um, uh, uh, for the Jeroboam story, because that is, of course, the most central a story that lends itself to a very central question, which is whether um, idolatry is ultimately a matter of belief or practice, right? And for Halevi, um, it, it certainly becomes one of, uh, of, of, of practice, right? Even though they were, um, even though Jeroboam and his, and his Shia, as he, uh, as, as he calls them, um, uh, you know, built the caps in order to worship the one true God, nonetheless, they fell into uh, idolatry. And that's something that seems to get tossed back and forth among uh, the medieval commentators. Um, I had another, another point that I seeing it. That's all I recall that you asked. Thank you. No, I mean, these are great suggestions. Thank you. Uh, yes, you in the back, and then Guy. Yes. Yeah, so I, in short, in short, I think they do. And so one thing I've been tracing is ways in which these various terms gets tra get translated into Hebrew, either by Maimonides, who's translating, you know, who's writing himself in Hebrew, uh, or in the Tibbinid translations. Uh, I'm looking a lot at Avraham ibn Ezra's um, use of language. So it seems to me that ibn Ezra um, is coining some new terms to capture some of the ideas here. So in one of the texts that we haven't looked at, you, know, you come across the phrase Din Musa in, in an Arabic text. Um, where you have a dean and then it's affixed to a particular founding figure. Um, when Ibn Ezra uh, comments on uh, Vizot Abraha, um, he comes to this, you know, this famous verse that everyone who works in polemics knows, where uh, you know, that God appeared at Sinai and God appeared at Seir and God came forth at Paran. And of course, you know, the Muslim reading of that passage is the, those three mountains are the three different stages uh, that it's Judaism, then Christianity, and then Islam, and then justifications for why Paran is Mecca. Um, Ibn Ezra says, you know, contrary to those who believe that uh, Seir refers to um, uh, uh, um, uh, let's see, I'm trying to remember. I have, I have it in my notes, but I, so uh, he says, uh, say Torah, Torah Muhammad. I have to look up what it is, but he uses. Uh, the word Torah in certain ways and the word dot in certain ways. Or like when he writes about astrology, um, he'll say, you know, as for the person who is born uh, uh, al dot Muhammad or something like that. So, so, so dot does take on a lot of new meanings. And so I think that's pushing toward where we end up, where you can study Limude Datot in, in a university, but it's a big intermediate stage.
Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a good thought. Yeah, I mean, you know, Halevi uses Dean very freely when he writes about the Khazar king, Kanem uh, Uchtahid fi Dean al Khazar. Um, you know, he exerted himself zealously in the Dean of the of the Khazar, and he talked. He refers to um, Ashab al Adyan, the the founders of of Adyan. Um, so he uses a lot. Of yeah, it's in the title of the book, right? Dean al uh, Dean al Halil. So it's uh, it's there. But he refers to also uh, pagans that way, not only to, not only the big three, let's say, it's also the Khazars. Uh, Guy, yes. I just think you again referred enough that this <laughs> is a very exciting project, and I repeat that, um, about religio, the, the medieval uh, term used for religion in the plural if I'm not mistaken, it's usually lex in Latin. It is. Uh, it is. Did you correct me if I'm not correct? Leges of the different people. Lex Judaica, yes. Lex Judeorum, Lex so, Mohammedorum, and so on. That's yes. the, which is very close to that, yes. actually. Yes. Uh, but that would be the text. Hmm? No, there, there is a, there, so there is, the there is a. Yes. No, no, no. It's, it's, no, it's, 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 it's. It, but it, it's, it's not though. I mean, so um, I, I only know this from secondary literature because I don't work in Latin myself. But there, there, there's, there, there's, an, there's an article by one woman. Um, her name's slipping my mind. She teaches at, um, in North Carolina, I believe, who basically argues that Lex stands in as like the word religion and doesn't refer only to the book, but actually refers to okay. something about. So, like later, you get. Anyway, yeah. That, that was a remark. But my, my hmm. second remark is the, the huge difference between the parallel between Islamic heresiography and Jewish medieval geography in Arabic, and what you have in late antiquity, the complete lack of similarity uh, between Christian patristic geography and Jewish rabbinic barely existent geography. You have the minim, and nobody knows who these minim are, and the the huge difference between the Jewish heresiography in Christian in the Christian era and in the Islamic er era being the lack in the first case of a, of a common language mm -hmm. of a common language and therefore of a common genre of the possibility of establishing a literary genre mm -hmm. in the same language. If you mm -hmm. if you speak in Aramaic while the while the the Christians have established they also have a literature in Aramaic, but this literature in Syriac has follows patterns developed in Greek. Mm -hmm. uh, you cannot have uh, any kind of comparison. Right. So okay, yeah, so this brings me back to um, uh, you know, I'm not a scholar of late antiquity, and I'd love it if somebody could weigh in about whether Daniel Boyarn's right about his argument that, um, you know, whereas Christianity tried to draw Jews into a debate along the lines of comparing different religions, um, Jews essentially, you know, with Tertullian introducing the category in the third century, um, that Jews opted out of that argument. They said, no, we're just simply going to continue to define ourselves as an ethnos, not defined by a set of beliefs and, pract and related practices. Um, so rather than playing the game, they just you know, keep, kept those games separate. And I think you know, what you're suggesting is this was partly um, 
uh, simply a fact of speaking different languages, right? And that, uh, that you don't have the word minute uh, in, 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 this, in the same way. And um, you know, that's possible. He sees it as active, right? That they really try to keep themselves from entering that debate. Um, and it might simply be a matter of language. Um, and that might help explain why the medieval discourse by Jews looks so very different in Arabic. In other words, they certainly do enter this, um, this, this type of discourse where they are comparing systematically uh, the laws, uh, the books and their reliability, the, the status of their prophets, um, and, and, and so forth. So it's just a very dramatic paradigm shift, if you will. You know, and it's not, not the new science, but it's a paradigm we shift. We don't have here anyone focusing on intellectual Jewish history in the Christian Middle Ages. Uh, it would be interesting to compare Jewish geography in Arabic and in Hebrew in Europe, in Christian Europe. Right. And I, I'm fascinated by the question of how lex comes to mean something, uh, something broad. Also, I, I don't know what's driving what. But. Well, this last discussion between, between you, I'm not so sure whether, whether it's totally correct with the picture which arises from the sources we have. I mean, one shouldn't forget that in the invention of Jewish sects was by Josephus who did define oh. Jewish sects. And uh, there are also a few terms for, for Jewish sects in, in, in rabbinic literature, literature. There are a few terms which appear here and there. I, I would say that in general they tried not to participate perhaps in this game. But here we again have also the problem that uh, definitely rabbinic literature does not represent all of Judaism right. of that time. That's where I think Boyarin so is wrong. The, the sectarian discourse, if we want to call it like that, could well have been existent in the in that period without being attested in the rabbinic sources. Of course, but, but we don't we don't have attestations. Uh, yeah, but we have a beginning with Josephus. We have. Uh, but the, the question of Josephus and. Uh, Josephus writes in Greek. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. He writes in Greek. And in Greek, I mean, there is no problem in these kind of categorizations in Greek. When you live in and think in Aramaic. I mean, the, co the continuation of Josephus is the church fathers, not the rabbis. Thinking about the heresies. The, the church fathers read Josephus, not the rabbis. Yeah, yeah but, but in, even in, in Jewish Palestine, in the, in the later Roman and early Byzantine period, uh, there were many Jews who were not rabbinic, and, and who were speaking. Yes. We had, don't have the sources, but. Uh, but, but actually now we, we know much more about, uh, about the fact, I mean, there are many studies about that, that the uh, do rabbinic dominance within Jewish society and even in Jewish Palestinian society was a, gradual, was a gradual process which, uh, which actually yes. took a long, long, long time. And uh, there probably have been many more religious My question was not about heresies, it was yeah. about the way one speaks about heresies mm -hmm. in the yeah, so, so I would add that I think where, where Boyarin's uh, book, The Borderlines, falls short is that it, it, it's talking about rabbinic literature and not Jews, broadly speaking. So if you look at other types of evidence, um, especially those who are opposed to the rabbis, you know, you might see a different picture. Um, but, you know, nonetheless, I think the medieval discourse is quite, is quite distinct. It would be very interesting to look at uh, Yosipon, right? This is something that I haven't done uh, to see how uh, the subject of sectarianism is is trans transferred there. Um, yeah, well, just you know the comment from the sort of social historian. Yeah. Um, the, the project is wonderful, except I have this kind of concern where it seems that you presented it as you know these Jewish thinkers are adopting a new way of thinking about religion or about themselves about uh, mm -hmm. Judaism. You know when they're reading Arabic uh, Muslim works, and in that in the discussion now, some sort of social change was mentioned, and and it seems to me like you know this project also. I mean I'm not sort of like Sabina saying you know you need to look at other genres. I'm also thinking your explanation has to also take into account social transformations. I mean it's not you know you don't need to be a Marxist to sort of imagine that the sort of new world that sort of the Muslim conquerors sort of created 
you know, played into this, and I mean, the most obvious uh, way of, uh, and I think Uriel Simonson, which we talked about, touches upon it, is, you know, the fact that the rabbis, for example, need to invent uh, or to really kind of uh, come up with a new idea of, about conversion, which doesn't sort of exist before, because, you know, people are converting. <laughs> and, and, they, and when I remember reading the Gaonic response about conversion, you know, it's a very rich field to look at exactly these words and I don't exactly remember which words, but I, I remember reading them thinking boyaring is wrong when you read these uh, Gaonic responses. Mm -hmm. so, so I would mm -hmm. just not forget the social yeah. transformation that they're yeah, feeding right. into, obviously, these rabbis. They're not just reading Islamic texts, they're living in a new world. Yeah, and so what I can't begin to picture at this point is what the organization of such a book will look like mm -hmm. um, and how I'm going to deal with the problem of these various, these various strains. Um, so, in short, yes. yes. <laughs> in short, yes. Um, you know, one, one interesting thing in Halevi's uh, uh, passage about Muslims and Christians is that he compares them to Gerim. Right? Um, he says, you know, if, if Muslims and Christians had not distorted their, their faith as they first received it and begun to worship the places where idols were worshipped, I would think of them as Gerim, who accept the who accept the law in its uh, in its usul, in its in its roots, but not in its branches, not in its furu. Um, and so, uh, you know, Danny Lasker wrote um, an article about that. And but what, what he was interested in that chap in, in that passage was to try to understand uh, what Gerut was in the mind in the mind of someone like Halevi. You can look at the same question the other way <laughs> and say, well, what is what? what are Islam and Christianity to him. And so basically you're dealing with a comparison of two things, neither of which is really stable. And I'm just trying to wrestle with that question of how to look at that at both, both ways at the same time. But the comparison is, is pretty striking that he makes that, and it is very much a social comparison. Yeah. Should we continue discussion? Do you want to look at some other passages, or do you want to go to sleep? <laughs> I want to go to sleep. <laughs> Don't forget, please, tomorrow to ask them to, ask them to Xerox the pages sure. in English. Sure. Some of us might be interested. Yeah, no, I better be sure then. Uh, so, any more questions? Uh, so, let's break, please, again, 10 minutes, not more, so that we won't be too late. We reconvene at 5.20 for the last presentation of the day. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.